Wow, great to see everyone this morning. Josiah, you're just getting taller and taller. I don't know what we're going to do there. Your mom is going to have to get a ladder to give you a kiss. <laughs> I have one announcement. It is not Christmas. I know a lot of times we talk about the birth of Jesus at Christmas. This is not a Christmas story. Uh, it doesn't relate to Santa. This is a Bible story about moms. And so what better time to talk about it than at this time as we can talk about this whole concept of what it means to be mom and what it means for us to be able to understand who they are and appreciate them. I hope you remember your mom today. I hope you're making the phone call. I hope you still can make the phone call. For a lot of us, that's not possible. But we remember still. As we look at this concept of Mary and what, who Mary was, it's one of those amazing things. Because an angel comes to her and an angel just begins to announce, you know, I've come to tell you you're going to have a child. Okay. Uh, first of all, that there's an angel that comes, and the first thing he says is, well, don't be afraid. Uh, you're always afraid once you see an angel. It's something to be afraid about. But the angel comes and says, don't be afraid. Well, he's there to be able to tell her what's going on. And the angel is going to tell you that so that you know you don't need to be afraid because sometimes angels are very scary. But Mary is a very ordinary person in every way, except one, and that is that God chose her. And so it's one of those times where God chose her. Now, there's not a special reason that we know of other than she's in the right tribe and the right lineage and everything else, but it's not that she won a lottery or that there's something physically different about her or that she has some greater ability She's just going to be mom like everybody else. The one thing that she does have is she is faithful to God, and she believes in God perhaps more than anybody else. They're not rich. They don't even have good luck. I mean, it's just one of those things that, okay, Mary, you have been chosen. They didn't have everything provided. They still had to work, and yet we find God does provide for them. Do you remember what you thought when you first held your child? I mean, other than, I hope the diaper holds. You watched that face and you watched those eyes, and it was always amazing to think about what's going to happen. What are they going to grow up to be? How big are they going to be? What kind of person are they going to be? What are they going to be able to to accomplish? What great things are they going to be able to do? And I think that's just a normal thing. When you look at this child, you realize that, you know, he can't do anything right now. But that's what it's all about, is, is being able to realize the potential that he has. And he looks so helpless, but we recognize that great things are going to happen. And we're expecting that, and we know that, and we're ready for that. And the angel comes and he tells Mary, great things are going to happen. In fact, the list is pretty amazing. He's going to be great. Well, of course he's going to be great, right? Your son or daughter was great, right? That's what we think. But that's what the angel says too. He's going to be great. Of course we know that. He's going to be son of the most high. We may not have known that. He's going to sit on the throne of David. In other words, he's going to be a king. He's going to be not only a king, but on the throne of the most successful king in all of Israel. He's going to be the one who sits on David's throne, the one who fought all those battles, the one who delivered them. He's going to be the Messiah king, that one coming. He's going to reign over the house of Jacob. He and his kingdom will never end. What an impressive thing. That's great. Not ever. And of course, the first question is, 
how. And he basically says, don't worry about that. Here's the answer. The Holy Spirit is going to come. Okay, that doesn't explain a lot other than the Holy Spirit's going to come. And I want you to know that's the answer every single time when God has something for us to do. The Holy Spirit's going to come. And, and then something greater will happen with that. He's going to be called the Son of God. He's going to be called holy. And Elizabeth, the one who couldn't have a child, is with child, and so she goes to, she wants to go see her. Mary's response is just so classic because of this. Mary said, Behold, I am the servant of the Lord. Let it be to me according to your word. Wow. Her faith is amazing. I mean, it wasn't a let me think about it. It wasn't this will happen in a little while. All right, I've got some plans to make or anything like that. Uh, her whole life just changed. And it just changed completely. Uh, so that there's not going to be anything similar to what she thought it was going to be. But that's her faith. Mary's in. She's one of those who's going to trust in God and she just needed the angel to explain it. We also realize it wasn't really a choice. I mean, the angel doesn't say, how about if you get pregnant? That's not what the angel says. The angel says, you're going to have a child. That wasn't a question. You're going to have a child. It's going to be there. But God knows her heart already. And we can see her attitude and we can see how she is and it's not about her refusal at all. It's about just letting her know that God knows who she is and that she is there to serve him. It's not going to be easy for her as we think about what's going to happen. The child is going to go through a lot. He's going to be worshipped. Right after he's born, wise men are on the way to be able to worship him. And they bring gifts, gold and frankincense and myrrh, and it's probably because of what comes next that they're bringing all of the gifts. And the what comes next is the threat of death. Because it's not just her child that is at risk. There are all of the children that are around that age at risk. And we realize that we have to try to keep them safe, and there's not a way to keep them safe. And I think that's what moms do all the time, is, is try to keep us safe. We try to do everything that's not safe, but they try to keep us safe so that, you know, we'll be protected and we'll be okay. They have to leave the country even in order to protect Jesus. What an amazing thing that is. He's going to be hunted. Babies are going to be killed because of him. There will be enemies in his own government. It is the leaders of the Jews that will be his own enemies. And he won't be treated well. I mean, at first, the, the amazement is there, how impressive it is, how amazing it is for what God has done. And, but then after you get used to a miracle or two, we don't notice as much. But moms are always protecting their children. A child who wants to bring faith to Israel Faith to a land that has all the promises of God and has the law of God and still has not understood who God is. A child who's going to be God born on earth. A child that's going to bring salvation to the world. What an amazing thing this is. And God is at work in her life. But we really see that God is at work all around us. Every single place, every place where we are, we see that God is at work in this. And I think that's one of the amazing things about it is when we are open to God and willing to let God take over, how much God is doing with us. We don't usually think every day is amazing. Was today amazing? Just say yes. Because that's what we tried to do, right? It's Mother's Day. So what do we do to make it amazing? Um, we're going to try and see if we can get into a really crowded restaurant with waiters that are completely overwhelmed and pay very exorbitant prices 
for a meal that we have to wait a really long time for. That's going to be amazing. And so we have done a great job for our wife and honored her by making her go through all of this. Well, okay, maybe there's a better plan. Maybe you know how to do something else. But we pick days like this to try to intentionally give honor. Mother's Day is one of those. How do you do that? How do you honor somebody? Do you buy them the card? Do you say nice things? Do you, what do you do? Well, we try to find a way to honor them, but most days are not honoring kind of days, are they? In fact, we'll be glad when this is over. We can go back to she's just mom. She doesn't have a day. She has to do all the work, all the cooking, all the cleaning, all the washing. And, you know, that's it. Well, you're, you're done with your one day. We've already honored you. We don't have special days, maybe because we don't see God working in the small things. But God is always working in small things. And all of the great big things are broken down into just one little piece. This day, I learned this. This day, I had this conversation. This day, there's something else that happens. And, and there's such small pieces that we don't really quite remember. It's more about, where's my socks? I got to wear shoes today, and so we're getting ready for something. And then you realize that, you know, I've had 18 years worth of socks, and now they're going away to school. What? How did that happen? All I did was have 18 years worth of socks, and now a life has been built. And we don't know everything that's coming. I think that's a great blessing to not know everything that's coming. We might be more excited or we might be more terrified if we really knew everything that was coming. And so we're better off taking it a day at a time, but I think we're also better off realizing every small thing that God is doing in our life and how those all fit together into one huge thing. We do know that we can respond to God now. We do know that we can worship God now. We know that we can pray to God now. We know that those things make a difference in our life. We just have to deal with today. We just have to obey God today and work with God today. You've already recognized that Mary Did You Know is the title of a song that was written by Mark Lowry and Buddy Green. One wrote the lyrics, one wrote the music back in the 80s. It was released in 1996. And it's just one of those songs that perhaps gives us some insight into who Mary was and into what's going on at that time. And so let me share with you the words of this song. It's amazing to sit and look into the eyes of a child. Mary, did you know that your baby boy would one day walk on water? Mary, did you know that your baby boy would save our sons and daughters? Did you know that your baby boy has come to make you new? This child that you've delivered will soon deliver you. Mary, did you know that your baby boy would give sight to a blind man? Mary, did you know that your baby boy would calm the storm with his hand? Did you know that your baby boy has walked where angels trod? When you kiss your little baby, you kiss the face of God. Mary, did you know? Mary, did you know that the blind will see, the deaf will hear, the dead will live again? The lame will leap, the dumb will speak the praises of the Lamb. Mary, did you know that your baby boy is Lord of all creation? Mary, did you know that your baby boy would one day rule the nations? Did you know that your baby boy is heaven's perfect lamb? That sleeping child you're holding is the great I am. Mary, did you know? 
Well, you've heard the promises. You've been looking for the Messiah. But I don't know that it ever comes so clear as when it's face to face. And it's right there. And that tiny hand created everything and created you. And there's always the family stories that you remember as you see them develop in their life. It's just another day of socks and sandals and different things that you have to do as they live their life. There's the time when they go to the temple to worship and Jesus stays a little bit extra, and so he's there on those days, and he's talking to the scribes and the Pharisees, and he's talking to all the, thing, to all the people that know a tremendous amount, but he's asking questions, and he's getting answers. And he's 12, and nobody wants to go home. What an amazing thing that is to have that in your scrapbook, Right? It's that, well, but he was lost for three days, and we didn't know where he was, and we didn't know what was going on, and we, you know, you want to be so mad at him, but you get there, and you say, where have you been in my father's house? Oh, kind of takes all the anger out of you, doesn't it? Didn't you know where I would be? Don't you know who I am? I had to be about my father's business. I had to be in all the things that he's trying to do, and I don't get a chance at the temple. We live in Nazareth, and you know how long this journey's been. And I'm 12 now. What an incredible thing to realize. That's his intention of where he wants to be. And she has helped him be there to understand God and who God is and to be able to make this so very important is not just the fact that God sent him, it's the fact that he had a mama who cared about what he learned, about how important Scripture was and about how important this whole concept is. And, of course, he has to be about his father's business. And then Jeff already mentioned about the wedding, and they come to the wedding, and she's there somehow responsible for the wedding, and uh, they run out of wine. She comes and says, they, they ran out of wine. Okay, what did you want me to do? <laughs> and she doesn't answer that question. She just turns to the servants and says, do whatever he tells you. And I agree with Jeff. It's like, Mom, <laughs> now what? Uh, here I am, and I'm. what am I supposed to? All right. So he tells them to fill the water jars with water, and uh, sure enough, when they serve it, it becomes the best wine that they've had in the whole thing. Do whatever he says. And everyone is amazed at Jesus and what Jesus is able to do. Well, not everyone, because not everyone thought he was great. And it's odd that it comes from the people in his own hometown, the ones where he grew up around that, that seem to have the most trouble with him. He is there trying to fulfill prophecy. He is there doing amazing miracles. He is teaching about the wonders of God. He is explaining how the law and the prophets fit together. He comes back home, and he's grown up. Do you remember that time when you came back home, and you were grown up, and you were like, okay, I'm going to be back home, and they're going to they're gonna think, wow, he's grown, and they're going to treat me as an adult now. No, they don't. I got back home, and I was still Howard's boy. And it's like, what? No, I'm grown up now. Yeah, just say that real loud. That convinces them. I'm grown up now. No, you don't even sound like you're grown up at all. That's just what you do. says, and when he had finished these parables, he went from there, and coming to his hometown, he taught them in the synagogue. 
so that they were astonished and said, where did this man get his wisdom in these mighty works? Is this not the carpenter's son? Is not his mother called Mary? And are not his brothers James and Joseph and Simon and Judas? Are not all his sisters with us? Where then did this man get all these things? And they took offense at him. And Jesus said to them, A prophet is not without honor except in his hometown and in his own household. And he did not do many mighty works there because of their unbelief. Jesus' teaching astonishes them. They don't know how he can know so much. And it's one of those things when you meet somebody that's really smart and you know they know a lot more than you do, the first thing you want to do is find a mistake, right? Let me see if I can't trip them up. Let me find something wrong with what they're saying. There's got to be some way to, you know, I, you're not that smart. You're not that much better than me. And, you know, because we're afraid that they are. And, of course, they look at Jesus and, well, we know who he is. We know where he came from. We know who his brothers are. We know where he's been. And who does he think he is? Well, the easiest way is to make somebody ordinary. To deny all the claims and to just make them as ordinary as you possibly can. And they can't understand the wisdom that he has, and they're a little amazed and a little upset. And they know his brothers, they know his family, they know where his family has been, and they have no respect for his family. I don't know about your family. Is that what happened with yours? That they didn't really help you along the way? I hope not. I hope they have been a great influence for you. But they don't expect anything from Jesus because they don't believe in anything his family's doing. He has been trained at the carpenter shop, and he has been a carpenter, I suppose, just an assumption. But Joseph has died somewhere in between here, and he's not mentioned. And actually, he's known as the carpenter's son, not the carpenter. And so he didn't stay. And he didn't take over the family business. And he didn't come back home to take over the family business when his father died so that he could provide for his family. What kind of a guy is he anyway? After all, I mean, he's not doing the things that his family needs. He should have come back and taken over the carpenter's shop. And how could he walk away from his family when they needed him? They needed somebody to be head of the house. They needed someone to provide. And the prophet is without honor among his own people. Mary understood. Mary followed him. Mary didn't stay at home wishing Jesus would come back, wishing Jesus was here. Jesus, why don't you come back to me and, and just live at home with me? Wouldn't that be great? No, Mary's not there either. Mary is the one who's gone. She's one of the women following Jesus. She's one of the ones who is always there for him. And the hometown just doesn't recognize the greatness of people. And it wants to make them very, very ordinary. And why would you do a great miracle to prove it all if they really don't believe? And so he doesn't do miracles. He could do miracles, but he doesn't do a lot of miracles. And a lot of times we are known by our family. A lot of times we have things to overcome because of our family. Or a lot of times we're in the place we are because of our family and because they have had great things. And so maybe your family was very supportive. I know mine was. My parents were constantly telling all the things I could do to me. I was like, no, I can't. <laughs> nope, you're expecting too much. Nope, that's not going to happen. I, you know, sometimes moms just have just unrealistic expectations. They already know their child is the greatest. And then you're looking at yourself and going, nah, it's not going to happen. But they believe in him. 
and mom can tell you what you can be and believe in what God can do in your life and she does not let the crowd make him ordinary. And maybe that's why the wedding at Cana and the statement, they're out of wine, yeah, but it's just Jesus. We already know about his family and we already know Jesus, they're out of wine. God is doing great things among them. And Jesus is there as God does great things among them. And I think maybe that's the key, is realizing the greatness of God and everything that God has and everything that God is doing. Because sometimes we don't know the immensity of what God is doing around us. We just kind of miss it because we're focused on socks or daily things, and we need to realize how great it is. And God just needs somebody to stand in that place and say, here's where I need somebody to be. You're not going to be the smartest guy. You're not going to be the one who does it all. You're not just stand here. And, And that's really all it is. To just stand there and be able to be in that place. And let God go through all the actions and let God do all the work around us because it's important he has somebody there. When we think about Moses and about what Moses was able to do as the children of Israel were led out of Egypt across a desert, the desert of sorrow and sin, to that new place, that new promised land where they could go and you realize, wow, that guy must have been incredible. Well, he had a little bit of training in Egypt. But we also realize that it was God that led the children of Israel with the pillar of cloud and the pillar of fire. And Moses is the guy who stood there. And when that moved, then Moses says, okay, we're going this way. He wasn't the one studying the geologic formations and saying, I think there's water over the next hill. He was the one who just said, we go this way because that's the way God is moving and that's the way God is going. And he spoke to the people, but you realize what he spoke to the people was, God told me this. He didn't make up his own words. He didn't say, I have all this wisdom. Let me tell you about this wisdom from God. He was like, well, God said this. And so he stood in his place. The Ten Commandments were not original to him. God said, and he spoke them, and he went up and he got the tablets, and he came back down, and here is your law. But God gave it. And everything that God said is what Moses did. He needs someone to stand there. He needs someone to stand at the edge of the Red Sea and say, stand still and see the salvation of God. He needs somebody to stretch out the rod across the Red Sea and stand in that place. But he didn't part the waters. And he didn't make the land dry. And he didn't, he just said, let's go forward. Okay, (laughs) but Moses, you're just the guy who's standing in the place. Absolutely. And he didn't make them all come back together, and he didn't make, it's just he's standing in the place. And people walked across because Moses told them to walk. Actually, because God told Moses to tell the people to walk, right? And so when we're that in tune with God and what God is doing, we see God doing great things around us, and we stand where God says to stand, and we speak what God says to speak. And the greatness of God is not dampened by the people who don't recognize his greatness. And when God does great things, we are involved in it. And when we all see the potential of a new life, Everyone goes around the baby and wants to see the baby, and they pretty much look alike. I mean, some have more hair. Okay, yeah, that's, that's a terrible thing to say on Mother's Day. 
Yours was beautiful, but the rest of them all look alike, okay? We believe in the greatness of God in a child, just like our mom told us. And then life happens, and things get difficult, and we don't always follow through, and mistakes are made, and it doesn't go the way it was supposed to go, and there's loss, and there's innocence that's gone, and we realize that we're not the child our mother talked about. We're the prodigal that we were afraid we would become, and that we are nothing special at all. And they're absolutely right. We're not. Because we've lost it. We've lost everything God ever did. We've lost his blessing. We've lost his promise. And we're nothing special. What Jesus does is give us the ability to see what God does in a person's life. We can see how mom and others can believe. We can see how sins can be forgiven because of Jesus. It is all about a cross. It's about how the death of Jesus and his time on a cross cleanses us, how he takes away our sin and how we make a covenant with him and how we're baptized into Christ and there's nothing else like it because everything is gone and the Holy Spirit has come to fill our life and to help us with all of those things that we did that were wrong, but now we've got God's Spirit in our life, right? And it's the same thing that the angel said to Mary when, when she said, how? Holy Spirit's going to come. And it is that Holy Spirit that fills us. And it is always that as the answer. We look at Samson, the strongest man in the world, and it says, and the Holy Spirit came mightily upon him. We looked at David, the guy who writes Psalms, and it's because he has the Holy Spirit of God. We look at Peter in Acts 2 when he stands up to talk about salvation in a new way, and it's you will receive the Holy Spirit. And we look at Peter when he stands up to the council And it's because the Holy Spirit is speaking in him and the Holy Spirit shakes the place. And we look at Paul and we find the Holy Spirit is in Paul as he teaches people, here's how it works. You don't have to worry about the how. You just have to believe God's going to do great things. What an incredible thing it is. We can't go back and make another Mother's Day. But we can be born again. And we can come to a new life, born of water and spirit. And absolutely everything that your mom believed about you can be true. It is not too late. You have not messed up so much that it cannot be forgiven by God. And you are great. Believe that. And he makes you righteous. And he makes you holy. And he gives you his spirit. Because Jesus is the one who comes and is working in us. What an incredible thing it is. We can see it in the eyes of a baby as we believe. How great that is. There's a new chance for this child. Then we look in the mirror. And there's a new chance for that child too. Because of what Jesus has done. It's not just your mom who believes in you. It's God as well. And he's working all around you. And you can have that forgiveness of sins. And you can have all the promises of God. And you can be great.
because of what God does in your life. Today, if we can help you accomplish that, that's what we really want more than anything else. It's really what Mary would have wanted be the way to say, Happy Mother's Day. Let's stand and sing.